Hello, physics students. This is Mr. Stanerson, and I want to take you through some different ways of looking at waves and how waves combine with each other um, in both constructive and destructive interference in this lesson. So this lesson is going to help us set up a better understanding of what um, constructive and destructive interference are. And it's also going to talk through how standing waves are developed. So we're going to go over some of that terminology. I'm going to give you a few examples, and you'll have some practice in a few later lessons. All right, so to get us started, what we're going to take a look at is just a quick review of some previous work that we've done, talking specifically about the formulas that we're using. And the first formula here is defining velocity or wave speed. The F stands for frequency, and the lambda stands for wavelength. So multiplying the frequency times the wavelength tells us how much velocity our wave has, so wave speed. The other thing is an important relationship between these two quantities right here. The first one is our period, how long it takes in seconds for one wave to occur. And the other one is frequency, <clears throat> and that's the inverse of period. So it's how many waves per second. So frequency is going to be the waves per second. And the period, we have that capital T, is the seconds per wave, okay? So as you can see, the terminology and the units are re reciprocals of each other. They're just flipping seconds over waves or waves over seconds, and so is the equation. So you can see here, if we take the inverse of the period, we have frequency, and if we take the inverse of frequency, we have period. So keep in mind, if you know one, you already automatically can calculate the other. All right, so the other things we're going to take a look at is just a quick review about some wave diagrams. I want you to be able to know how many waves there are. So if we start in the trough of one and go to the next, that's one wave, two, three waves here. And the period is happening, one wave happens every four seconds. So four seconds is the wave um, uh, period and the time for one wave. And then if we take that and turn that around into frequency, there's one wave every four seconds. So one fourth is our frequency in Hertz. The amplitude is two, again, counting the boxes um, will tell you the amplitude. So I want you to be really good at identifying those parts of the wave and telling me amplitude, frequency, um, and um, um, period by just looking at a, a diagram and a drawing. All right, the other thing we're gonna take a look at in this lesson is talking through some ideas around interference. And waves have a very special property. Um, there's not a lot of other things that I can think of that can occupy the same space at the same amount of time. So if I have one wave coming in from one direction, imagine you're on Lake Minnetonka in the summer and you're out boating with friends and the wake from one boat is approaching your wake and your wake is approaching theirs and all of a sudden they pass through each other. Well, there's a brief moment of time where those waves are actually occupying the same space, the same physical water at the same time. Now remember a wave is a disturbance and it's an energy transfer. So what happens is the energy is transferring through the same medium, it's just coming from two different sources. And so that's what we call in science, we call that idea when we combine waves, when they're in the same location and they combine to make a new wave, whether it be bigger or smaller, um, then we call that an interference effect. Here's the key thing though, after those waves meet and they pass through each other, they are unchanged, they continue unchanged. So they retain the same amount of amplitude, they retain the same amount of energy that they had before the interaction. Okay, so those are some things that we're gonna be coming back to. We have a few different ways that waves can meet. So if I take a look at this first example, I have a wave coming from the left and a wave coming from the right. Now there's a couple of things that could happen. These waves could just collect and bounce off each other or they could kind of cross through each other. And what really happens is they actually pass through each other, and in doing so, there'll be a brief time where their amplitudes combine to make a larger wave. And that's what this picture in the middle is showing. The overlapping of this wave, the red one, and the overlapping of the green one produces this new wave, this blue wave in the middle. And then afterwards, they continue to pass past each other, okay? So um, for a brief moment in time, those amplitudes do combine and they are added together. 
This is called constructive interference because the waves actually make a larger wave. They don't have to be the same amplitude. So this one could be an amplitude of one. This one has an amplitude of two. They add together to make an amplitude of three. Similarly, I could have one that has an amplitude of three on this side and one on this side, and it'll make an amplitude of four and, and when they're combined together. So we always combine those amplitudes when we're talking about constructive interference. Destructive interference, just like the name says, is going to be very opposite. So we're going to have a wave that might have a positive amplitude and a negative amplitude. When those waves meet, if they have the same amount of amplitude, this one has one and this one has a negative one, they actually meet in the middle and they cancel each other out. So those... Um, this is called destructive interference as we're going through. And just like the constructive, they don't have to have the same amplitudes for this to happen. So I could have an amplitude of two here, one here, then the resulting wave has an amplitude of one, okay? And the same thing is true when we combine um, all these waves that are coming at each other and they're opposite. When a crest meets up with a trough, okay? Then it's going to cause this destructive interference. All right, so we're gonna take a look at a couple examples, and this would be like a rope where there's a wave on either side and they're kind of coming together. Right here, the wave crest and crest are gonna meet up, and so that's gonna make a larger crest. We're gonna call that constructive interference. Here, the crest would meet up with the trough, and it does so in the middle to kind of cancel it out, but then after the fact, the waves continue in their opposite directions as destructive interference. Where does this happen? Well, in practical world, and when we're talking about sound waves, we might be in an auditorium, and there are certain spots in that auditorium where the sound actually is louder. So the music being played on the stage reaches your ears, and it actually sounds amplified, even though it's not going through any more speakers or amplification. That's constructive interference. So the auditorium is designed in a way that the sound is bouncing off the walls, the floor, the ceiling, and it's creating a amplified effect when it reaches the audience. That's one way to think about constructive interference. Destructive interference might be noise canceling headphones um, or audio suppression on, on a microphone where it's going to be listening to the ambient sounds in the room and it's actually broadcasting a signal either digitally or auditorily and it's going to be canceling that noise. And so it sends the opposite amplitude. If it was a crest, it sends a trough and it will work to try to cancel that at the exact time it reaches your ears. So you hear less of that noise. All right. Now, when we um, combine our constructive and our destructive interference in the same uh, medium or the same material, like if we have a rope or a spring or a slinky, often what we can do is create a pattern that is um, repeating itself, and we call that a standing wave. So what this happens is if the green wave is moving to the right, as it goes to the end over here, this fixed end is actually going to flip that wave upside down and send it back the other way. And in doing so, the waves that are being continually sent in this direction and then continually bouncing back and returning this way tend to meet up sometimes where their crests connect, and that's going to make a larger wave, and sometimes where a crust and a trough meet, and that's going to make a lower wave. We call these things nodes and antinodes. The node would be where two of the, uh, where the destructive interference is the greatest. So a crest and a trough meeting up. An antinode would be where the constructive interference is the greatest, where a crest and another crest or a trough and another trough meet up. And that happens um, in all of our standing wave patterns. All right, so we're going to be taking a look at what does the standing wave pattern look like and how can we use this to maybe dig into um, some waves a little bit more. Notice this looks a lot like those jump rope waves that you might see. Um, so I just have a little person in here jump roping. Uh, but that kind of gives you that, that image that the wave isn't moving back and forth, even though there's a lot of constructive and a lot of destructive interference happening at the same time. So they're called standing waves, but it's a little bit of a misnomer. The wave is actually, there are waves actually transferring in that medium. So in this case, we have one standing wave. And you can see that here. And the wavelength, though, is a half a wave. And you can see that because if I was to draw a full wave, remember it looks more like this, we're really only focusing on that top part. 
So that's the half of wave, but it counts as one full standing, one standing wave. This has two standing waves and one full wavelength. This one would have three standing waves, so one, two, three, and there is one and a half wavelengths. Hopefully you're kind of seeing this pattern develop as I go through it. So let's work on this last one together. I'm looking at this and it looks like there's one, two full um, waves, so I have two wavelengths, but one, two, three, four standing waves. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this just like we did with some of the other wave properties as a way of keeping track and communicating about our standing waves. Okay, um, the other thing we can t look at are nodes and anti-nodes. Notice when there is a one standing wave, we're going to have um, two nodes and one anti-node. When there's two standing waves, we have three nodes and two anti-nodes. And then we just kind of increase that pattern. When there is one and a half or three, um, three standing waves, one and a half wavelength, we have four anti nodes and then three anti nodes. Similarly, if we have one, two, three, four standing waves, we're going to have five nodes and four anti nodes. Okay, so the number of nodes is always one more than the number of standing waves that we have because you count both ends. All right, so we're going to take a look at that. Now, we can also apply what we've learned before about wavelength and even wave speed to our standing waves. So if we know the distance between the node here and the node here is six meters, that's half of a wavelength. And we can take our wave equation, our wavelength is going to be the distance divided by the number of wavelengths, in this case, uh, half of one. So the full wave would be 12. And you can imagine that. If this is half the wave, it's six, the full wave has to be 12. Again, if I have one full wave, I already know that the number of wavelengths is one, so I better have four meters for my wavelength. If I have one and a half, well, one wave stops here. The one and a half is nine. So to the halfway would be three. Another three would be six or taking nine, the total that we have divided by the number of wavelengths gives me the amount for each one. In this case, six meters is my wavelength for that standing wave. Similarly, if I know the whole distance is 12 and I know there's two standing waves in there, two full wavelengths, um, and then I can divide that out and I get a wavelength of six. Okay, so kind of working through those differences for our standing waves, it's going to be an important part of our next step when we calculate and we do some of the lab work with wave interactions, standing waves, constructive and destructive interference. Thank you and have a great rest of the afternoon.